Hello, and welcome to the Political Institutions and Political Economy Pipe Workshop at the Bedrosian Center here in the Price School at the University of Southern California. I'm Jeff Jenkins, the director of the Bedrosian Center and the Pipe Collaborative. And our workshop speaker today is Anna Gujmala Bussa. Anna is the Michelle and Kevin Douglas Professor of International Studies, the director of the Europe Center, and a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute at Stanford University. Her research focuses on state development and transformation, religion and politics, political parties, and post-communist politics. Other areas include populism, informal institutions, and the role of temporality and causal mechanisms in social science explanations. Anna's presentation today is entitled, Till He Goes to Church, The Religious and Medieval Roots of the European State. Following Anna's presentation, we'll have a formal discussant, Jared Rubin from Chapman University, to provide some comments. During Anna's talk, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box or the Q&A box. I'll be monitoring questions as the talk goes on. And without further ado, I give you Anna Gujmala Bussa. Great, thank you so much, Jeff, for inviting me. Um, and thank you, Jared, for um, providing the comments. So as the, um, Jeff already mentioned, the title of this talk is Tilly Goes to Church, um, The Medieval and Religious Roots of the State. And this is part of a bigger book project um, entitled Sacred Foundations. Um, in this book project, I basically posit that religious rivalry and emulation are the key mechanisms of state building um, in medieval Europe. And this provides a challenge to existing accounts, which have focused on war and bargaining um, and on the early modern era. So what do I mean by state formation? Um, this is not about sort of you know, the creation of variant cages of reason or sort of an impersonal bureaucracy. This is a much earlier stage of amassing authority over territory and population, of acquiring sovereignty, which means sort of you know, internal monopoly and freedom from external intervention, and state capacities, capacities to provide justice, um, law and order, to extract taxes, and to develop an administration that will basically um, you know, govern all of this. Now, Europe is sort of an interesting um, research site. On the one hand, it's the archetype of state formation. Um, you know, basically, this is where scholars first developed theories of state formation. And this is where um, subsequent scholars, whether working on China or on subsequent time periods or Latin America, always kind of you know, hark back to. But it's kind of ironic because Europe is actually fairly unique. And it's kind of a, kind of a bizarre exemplar of state formation. First, it's a place where territorial authority was totally fragmented. This is someplace where you see over 500 small little states that eventually consolidate. It's someplace where religion and state or religion and rule have separated relatively early on. You don't have the kind of fusion that you sometimes observe um, in other cases. And above all, it's the one place where we see national assemblies that have as their governing principles, both consent and representation binding consent um, and uh, corporate representation specifically. And I'll argue that each of these actually has the medieval church at its roots. Now the canonical accounts of state formation in Europe and elsewhere are so-called bellicist accounts. They focus on interstate warfare in the early modern period, um, roughly 1500, 1750 CE. Um, they view fragmentation of territorial authority as a given and institutions as incidental. Um, Charles Tilly refers to them as, you know, these happy byproducts um, of the drive to produce, to extract resources and to arm uh, ourselves. In this story, warfare consolidates states. So we have fewer and stronger states as a direct result of the kind of early modern warfare that we see. The key actors as a result are secular monarchs and princes. This is a story of rulers basically in conflict with each other, um, encroaching on each other's borders and populations, grabbing resources and a survival of the fittest. And the result of this is that we have the first notions of sovereignty with Jean Boudin um, and with the Treaty of Augsburg in the 16th century, so quite late in the game. And in this project, I basically offer something of a revisionist view, where rather than focus on the early modern period, I focus on religious rivalry and emulation in the Middle Ages, a much, you know, basically 250 years before um, the sort of the heyday of early modern state making. Rather than fragmentation being a given or institutions being incidental, I argue that both are deliberate. 
and they are both deliberate creatures of church efforts. Warfare, as a result, destabilizes states rather than consolidating them. And the key actors are also secular rulers, but also popes and bishops. And as a result, the first notions of sovereignty don't come in the 16th or 17th century, but arise as early as the 13th. In short, to quote my favorite political theorist, uh, Monty Python, no one quite expects uh, their religious intervention. Now, the main points for the rest of this talk will be to talk about the deep roots of state formation, to talk about the medieval church as a rival to kings and princes, and as a template for subsequent institutional formation. Now, why would the medieval church be such a powerful rival? The thing to remember is that this is the single most powerful geopolitical actor in the Middle Ages. It has enormous wealth. Um, it basically owns anywhere from 25 to 30% of the land in, in a given territory. Um, it has a very broad and wide ranging organization. Its network of bishops, um, monasteries, cathedrals reaches all over Europe. And so it's an incredibly present force in ways that the state could not broadcast power at the time. It is a treasure house of human capital with monasteries that preserve documents um, and create sort of, you know, a culture of learning with bishops who act as judges, regional administrators and emissaries of the Pope. And above all, with spiritual authority. It's the only political actor who can promise salvation or conversely, um, basically exclude people from it. And as a result, this incredibly powerful church eventually enters into conflict over both authority and autonomy with secular rulers. Now, what are the origins of this rivalry? Well, basically until the 11th century, the state controls the church, specifically in the lands, something the post Carolingian lands, what we see are emperors and kings who name popes, um, who name bishops and other clergy, who own churches outright, and who profit from the various church taxation that we see. The key antagonist here is the Holy Roman Empire as it becomes known in 1254. Um, here's an image of Pope Leo III crowning Charlemagne in 800, which is sort of the start of first the Carolingian Empire and then its successor, um, the German Holy Roman Empire. And this German empire has huge territorial ambitions. Now this comes in direct conflict with um, the church because here Gregory VII, a Pope who basically um, is a mid 11th century Pope, um, launches an ambitious reform program. The point here is to sort of you know, reform the church from within, to enforce discipline, to centralize authority within the church, and to finally really sort of consolidate a papal hierarchy so that the Pope really controls the church. On the one hand, on the other hand, Gregory is sick and tired of the situation where the Holy Roman Emperors basically name bishops and name popes and control the church and its resources. And see, he wants autonomy from the secular rulers. So we have these two conflicting ambitions. On the one hand, what will become the Holy Roman Empire controls the church and wants its territory. On the other hand, the church wants autonomy from these secular rulers. And this is kind of you know, the nightmare and the dream scenario, depending on which actor you are. What we see in yellow here are the territories of the Holy Roman Empire around 1200. Um, this section in orange is the Kingdom of Sicily, which is also sort of, you know, partly controlled by the Holy Roman Empire. And the purple are the papal states. So the nightmare for the church is that in a pincer movement, the Holy Roman Empire consolidates control over the entire, entire Italian peninsula and basically leaves the church fully under control of the Holy Roman Empire. And then, of course, is by, con uh, by you know, the converse property, very much the ambition of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, in order to fight against this, in order to assert its authority and its autonomy, the church relies both on spiritual and temporal weapons. The spiritual weapons include interdicts and excommunications, which are ways of basically excluding either communities or individuals from the community of the faithful. Basically, if you're excommunicated, you cannot achieve salvation. And the idea here is that if you're an excommunicated ruler, your vassals and your nobles no longer owe you loyalty. They're free to go as they please. So technically, this should be a relatively powerful weapon in fighting against um, a secular authority. But the popes, as we'll see, also rely on temporal weapons, on alliances, crusades, and wars by proxy. So how do these work? How effective are they? To test the impact of this rivalry and to sort of test the impact of these papal efforts to establish autonomy, I gather a whole bunch of data on papal conflict, excommunications, monasteries, bishoprics, and universities. Um, it spans basically a thousand years of European history with over 30,000 uh, city year observations. 
And it also builds on existing and fantastic data sets on secular conflict, formation of cities and communes, parliaments, and so on. And the examined outcomes that I examined, at least in this paper, are threefold. First, the instability and fragmentation of authority, the timing of the rise of state institutions, and the rise of this concept of state sovereignty, all of which I argue have to do with the church and these patterns of rivalry and emulation. So first, when it comes to spiritual weapons, we can see that they really peak during the sort of heyday of papal power. So from basically the 11th through the end of, uh, through this, the end of the 14th, 13th century, beginning of the 14th century. This is when popes really sort of start to excommunicate and really sort of start to flex their muscles. Um, the, so the pink graph represents the heyday of papal power, and these are explicitly political excommunications of rulers and of princes. And you can see that um, the heyday coincides with their use of the excommunications, which rapidly fall off after the Reformation. Now, does this affect ruler durability? Does this work? Well, it turns out it works a little bit. So the red line here are excommunicated rulers and the gray are non-excommunicated rulers. And basically, the only way that excommunications really shape or influence um, rulers is during the early vulnerable years of their governance. So in the first 15 years or so, if you're excommunicated, your survival drops a little bit. But afterwards, it turns out, your survival rate is either indistinguishable from or higher than those of excommunicated, of non-excommunicated rulers. So basically, these spiritual weapons might sort of, you know, affect rulers on the margin, but they're not really effective at um, destabilizing their, uh, their rule. So instead, popes turn to temporal weapons. And these consist of, sort of you know, four main different um, ways of attacking the, the secular rulers. The first of which are wars by proxy. So basically, um, the popes will fund mercenary, you know, this is kind of it's very much a mercenary project. They fund wars by proxy, they fund different armies, they fund different commanders to basically attack um, Holy Roman emperors and other rulers that they deem hostile. Secondly, and this is probably the modal way in which this warfare is conducted, there are alliances and coalitions. So this whole time, basically, the church is involved, the papacy is involved in a very so fine sort of balancing of power. Um, it, for example, is willing to let England do all whatever it wants because it wants England to stay out of the conflict, the theater of conflict. Um, on the other hand, it'll attack, you know, the French, sometimes the French king, sometimes the, um, the Holy, and almost always the Holy Roman Emperor, in an attempt to basically balance power and prevent the rise of the Holy Roman Empire as a rival hegemon. The popes also engage in crusades. We tend to think of these as, you know, foreign expeditions that basically sent off people on these, you know, to faraway lands to um, basically protect their faith. But in reality, most of the crusades that we see in Europe are internal affairs. They're sort of, you know, basically um, armed incursions into other states designed to extirpate either heretics or to consolidate papal control. And they're explicitly political in aim um, rather than, you know, in being sort of um, religious expeditions. And finally, popes attempt to depose um, kings and other rulers. And they do so with sort of the active consent of other nobles. This is basically another form of alliances where they basically depose the king or emperor, say that this king or emperor has no sort of legitimation. This is very much in Jared's work, um, in line of Jared's work on the sort of spiritual legitimation of rulers. So they withdraw the spiritual legitimation um, in, concert, in concert with secular supporters. Now, as a result of this, as a result of these efforts, what we see is quite extensive fragmentation. But basically, you know, existing accounts view the fragmentation of uh, territory in Europe as a post-Carolingian status quo. This is basically what happens when the empire falls apart, and it stays this way, that way until the early modern period. But what I'm going to argue is that it's actually deliberate, and it really takes off with papal efforts. The goal is to prevent this German takeover, this German hegemony, um, something that, you know, the history of Europe is, is basically, um, it's a constant in the history of Europe to prevent basically German hegemony. And it's also a way for the church to ensure its autonomy and internal power. And so when we look at these weapons of papal conflict, at sort of, you know, alliances, at crusades, and so on, it turns out that they are very so strongly associated with territorial fragmentation. So the popes may not be doing such a great job in destabilizing individual rulers, but they sure, they sure as heck can um, destabilize their control over territorial authority. 
And so here, basically, the medieval period is represented by, by the blue lines, the early modern by the red. And what's striking is that secular conflict seems to have a weak relationship with the fragmentation of territorial authority, as does papal conflict in the early modern era. But in the medieval period, what we see is basically papal conflict being strongly associated with the fragmentation of territorial authority in ways that secular conflict just simply isn't. The result is that this is a map of Europe in the, in the 1300. That big colorful blob next to um, France, which is in magenta here, is basically the Holy Roman Empire. Um, and it's kind of you know, multiple tiny little principalities. And this fragmentation persists. So what we can see, this is a graph that basically lays out you know, how many different states exist within sort of, you know, the modern uh, boundaries of a given territory. And the top line is basically the Holy Roman Empire. What you can see is that the, the fragmentation really takes off with papal efforts, right? So around 1100, where the papacy really gains its power, the fragmentation takes off and it stays basically, so it reaches its peak around 1300 and is then maintained. Contrary to Tilly and other sort of stories of early modern consolidation of territory, we do not see a consolidation of territory. This sort of radical time you know, when territory, uh, territorial authority consolidates um, and small states are eliminated in the Holy Roman Empire at all. In fact, what happens is that both in Italy and in Germany, um, the consolidation of authority happens in the mid 19th century. It's an explicitly political project and it has nothing to do with early modern warfare, um, which is a period of, as you can see, continued fragmentation. Now, why is that? Why does this fragmentation that the church sort of starts persist for so long? And why is it so impervious to warfare and other efforts that should have consolidated this territory? It's long lasting because as a result of church efforts, nobles, bishops, and princes gain enormous power in the Holy Roman Empire. They basically, you know, as you know, the, the emperor is distracted with all this warfare, as he's continually fighting abroad, um, these guys basically grab on, grab power and establish their own sort of fiefdoms within the Holy Roman Empire. At the same time, self-governing or autonomous cities, communes gain enormous power. When, you know, when there's sort of an absence, a vacuum at the top, the mid-level can gain enormous amounts of power. And even as the church weakens, you know, the church basically after the Protestant Reformation ceases to be a major political player in, um, in Europe, these powerful vested interests nonetheless persist. And because you know, there are sort of, you know, local nobles and princes and these self-governing cities, that precludes the kind of um, consolidation of power that the Bellicists would have predicted. We, so and as, as a result, we can also see that self-governing cities are also strongly associated with this kind of papal conflict. Again, here are the blue lines uh, represent the medieval period. The red are in um, are the early modern. As before, these are sort of you know, standard OLS regressions with two-way fixed effects for city and year effects. And what we can see is that papal conflict basically strongly, you know, strongly leads to self-governing cities in the medieval period, um, even as it very much is associated negatively with them, um, with communes basically in the early modern period. The opposite holds for secular conflict which basically precludes the rise of self-governing cities um, in the medieval period, but you know, that relationship is greatly attenuated subsequently in the early modern era. Now, second, um, the, fragmentation, the fragmentation of power is also accompanied by something very, very different. And that is the timing of state institutions and the way in which they arise. This is partly as a result of fragmentation, and partly as a result of the second mechanism that I identify, which is really sort of the emulation of church templates. And here, as we can see, the church is really a pioneer in the founding of state institutions. As early as, you know, basically um, the beginning of the 11th century, we see the church develop institutions. And here, you know, this graph summarizes these. The top line on the red is the church. And these are institutions such as taxes, courts, chanceries, archives, um, taxation efforts, and so on. And there are sort of three things to note about this pattern. The first is that the church is the pioneer. It really sort of you know, is the first one to develop these institutions in Europe. The second is that the Holy Roman Empire, which is in purple all the way down on the bottom, is the last one to develop centralized state institutions. If there are attempts to do this around 1500, these institutions are very brittle and they don't quite do the job they're designed to do. So they're both delayed and far less robust 
And the third thing to note is that, so if you know the fantastic story of England and its very early development of a centralized state um, basically follows on the heels of church efforts. And the way that it arises really has to do with the church keeping England out of the conflict. So the church is willing to make all kinds of concessions. It basically sort of, you know, legitimizes the conquest of England. It tells William and his successors that they can do what they do, what they want to do, including control the English church. Um, they can develop basically sort of a centralized set of institutions and uniquely English institutions like common law, because the church just wants to stay England, uh, wants to keep England out of this theater of conflict. And so why do we observe this pattern? Basically, in places where the popes really interfere, there's an inability to consolidate central power, and that in return, in turn, basically delays the adoption of central state institutions. And that's important because the church also provides templates for the adoption of church institutions. Um, and in areas such as administration, law and learning, and parliaments, these are all key areas where basically church templates form and shape how these institutions arise. So when it comes to administration, for example, the familiar division of labor at courts of chancery, finances, and judiciary comes basically directly from sort of, you know, papal templates that were developed in the 11th century. Bishops serve as judges, lords, and administrators for both kings and for popes. So they are in this amazing role of basically serving both as conduits of these papal templates and as sort of, you know, dual secular and um, sacred representatives. They are sort of critical to the administration of secular, um, secular governance and to serving as spiritual emissaries of the Pope. And everything from formulas to document templates is adopted from the church. So for example, this is the Magna Carta. And you know, this is a fairly lengthy document, um, but notice the handwriting. It's identical to the, the papal minuscule that was adopted basically about, a, you know, about 100 years earlier. And what's interesting about this, this is the papal bull that condemns the Magna Carta and basically annuls it. But they both use the same handwriting, which was diffused through sort of, you know, clergy and through bishops to secular courts. When it comes to law, um, we see basically as a result of sort of conflict between popes and emperors, we see the rise of law in you know, the rediscovery of Roman law in the 11th century and the systemization of canon law in the 12th. And both of which, are, and both of these are taught in basically side by side at universities. They are both form the basis of European civil law. Um, and in both cases, judges, you know, the judges are bishops, right? And so this is, you know, a, an image of Pope Gregory the Ninth handing down canon law to basically his representatives. And all the way on the right hand side, it is being presented to a bishop who is sitting in judgment at a secular court. So the whole sort of foundation of law arises both because of the incentives created by the fragmentation and because the church basically has the records, has the archives, and has the capacity to read them and wield them as a weapon in the conflict with secular rulers. This also leads to the rise of universities. Basically, the first universities, including Bologna in 1088, are all founded as law schools. And both popes and emperors sort of compete to charter and to protect universities because they're both so keen to gain the human capital that's being produced at universities and the legal expertise with which they can better sort of, you know, enter into this competition. This guy, by the way, is someone that you know, we have either all been this guy or have taught this guy at some point in our careers, um, an all too familiar image. And finally, when it comes to parliaments and representation, this is of course you know, a famous image of the English parliament. What's critical here is that the church basically creates, it reinterprets Roman law, and it, in its own councils, it uses the notions of binding consent and proctorial representation. And what binding consent basically means that you know, laws that touch all ought to be decided by all. The famous quad omnes rule comes directly from the church, as does the notion of proctorial binding representation, that a corporation or a community can send a representative who can then make decisions that are binding on the entire community and that the entire community has to follow when he or she returns. These two notions critically are what basically underpin modern parliamentary representation. And they both come directly from the church um, and its sort of you know, own practices and its synods and councils and its reinterpretations of Roman law. So against again, existing accounts, which focus either on war or on elite bargaining, all these institutions arise before the costly wars of the 16th, 17th century. 
They don't arise because of this war. They're in place long before the wars begin. They're not incidental. They're not these happy byproducts. But instead, they rely on church templates and innovations. Um, and the timing of their adoption really relies on how fragmented territorial authority is within a given territory. And contrary to accounts that claim that the church basically is always bad for growth, they in fact promote human capital, trade, and economic growth by creating both sort of legal expertise, bodies of law, and the courts that can then enforce these laws um, and secure property rights and contracts. And finally, we come to sovereignty. Now, classically, sovereignty is associated with you know, unhappy looking guys like Jean Baudin on the left or Thomas Hobbes on the right. But the deeper roots of sovereignty are actually go, far, uh, go back earlier to the medieval era and they're religious. And basically there are sort of three episodes that form very early notions of sovereignty. The investiture conflict, in a sense, the third Peribenarbilium decree and the conflict between Boniface VIII, Pope Boniface VIII and Philip IV over taxes and justice. So let me just briefly go through one of these and so sort of show you how these eventually lead both to state church separation and to notions of sovereignty long before they're supposedly um, formulated in the 16th and 17th centuries. So first, when it comes to separation of church and state, the kind of key episode here was the so-called investiture conflict, which ran basically for 50 years um, around the turn of the 11th and 12th centuries. And the nominal issue was who names the bishops? There's a complicated procedure over how bishops are named and both kings and popes claimed authority over this naming. Um, the Concordat of Worms in 1122 divvies up these roles and supposedly settles this very narrow issue. But the real import here isn't so much with who gets to name the bishops, it's the fact that for the first time we see a formal separation of authority, a formal separation of the two spheres, that the church and the state have different and distinct roles to play, not just in the naming of bishops, but in the exercise of authority more broadly. So this basically sets up the idea that there's a sacred and a secular sphere for the first time in Western history. And that's a separation that occurs much, much earlier. And in fact, it never occurs in some certain you know, development as you know, some people claim that you know, Islam and the Islamic states never have this kind of separation of church and state. This also separates church and state in ways that doesn't occur in Byzantium, for example, um, which you know, shares similar religious roots with the Western Catholic Church, but where the church never gets its sort of, you know, autonomy and it never separates itself distinctly from imperial rule. Of course, the signal episode here, and this is you know, sort of the set piece that you will hear in all medieval focus talks, is the famous um, walk of shame or the, you know, the humiliation at Canossa, where Henry IV, um, this young emperor, starts to name his own bishops. Gregory VII, whom we saw earlier, promptly excommunicates him. And because the nobles and princes that are supposedly loyal to the emperor start to abandon him, Henry IV takes his family, um, crosses the Alps in the January snows, and stands in front of Gregory VII, wearing some, you know, he's pictured shot here, but he's supposed to be barefoot, barefoot and wearing these rough woolen garments for three days in the snow, knowing full well that by expressing this kind of penitence, the Pope has to forgive him. And so basically, you know, this is kind of a, a bit of religious jujitsu. The Pope has to forgive the emperor. The emperor is forgiven. He regains his power and the conflict continues. Now, a final episode in this story is that of creation of notions of sovereignty itself. So in 1202, Pope Innocent III issues a decree. And again, this is aimed against the Holy Roman Empire. He claims that a king is in his own kingdom an emperor. The idea here is that there is no hierarchy, right? This basically introduces, um, this is an anti-hierarchical statement. There is no imperial hierarchy in Europe. No king has to pay obeisance to the Holy Roman Emperor. Every king is an emperor in their own kingdom. Now, you can imagine how readily adopted this is by kings. Kings absolutely love this formula because it means that it's a way to, for them to assert sovereignty, both sort of, you know, domestic monopoly on power and a freedom from foreign intervention. It's also a way of gaining autonomy from the imperial designs of the Holy Roman Emperor. So this becomes sort of, you know, a relatively big deal. Of course, subsequently, um, these kings realize that if every king is an emperor in his own kingdom, that means they don't have to, to listen to the Pope either. Um, so, you know, it's another sort of way, way in which these are kind of unintended consequences of these actions. But be that, be that as it may, this is the first assertion of a notion of sovereignty um, in Western Europe. And this basically gets confirmed in practice 
by the episode between the Pope and the French king around the turn of the 14th century. Where basically first the, the Pope asserts that um, you cannot, he cannot be, a clergy in France cannot be taxed without his permission. And then asserts that a bishop organ, uh, accused of treason has to be judged by, uh, by a church court. Philip IV won't have any of it. He basically sends one of his henchmen, uh, portrayed here in a subsequent painting, sends one of his henchmen, Nogre, who basically terrorizes Boniface VIII, uh, VIII and leads him to basically concede. But what's critical here is that this is of an assertion of sovereignty in practice, right? Philip IV says, you, the Pope, have no right to forbid the, me taxing the clergy, and you have no jurisdiction within my kingdom because I am the king here. According to your own rules, I am the emperor in my own kingdom. So both in theory and in practice, sovereignty gets asserted much, much earlier than you know, the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. By 1300, we already have sort of, you know, statements of sovereignty in both theory and in practice. So what we see here is a very active role of the medieval church um, in fragmenting territory, the starting point for bellicist and bargaining accounts is really sort of a deliberate effort by the church. And it's a fragmentation that persists throughout the early modern period, despite the predictions of um, bellicist theories. We see patterns of institutional adoption and adaptation where the church provides the templates and the resources with which um, rulers can build their own secular states. And we see the separation of church and state and the rise of sovereignty relatively early on, which again marks kind of a unique European path. And this unique European path is also marked by other organizations and institutions that the church plays a very active hand in developing, such as the rule of law, the rise of universities and human capital, and um, the growing power of parliaments um, in some countries. Now, what happens basically here is a feedback loop, right? This rivalry and this emulation wind up strengthening the state. There, you know, at the outset, you know, the church is basically uh, you know, challenges secular authority, it hands over these sort of institutional templates through the bishops, and the result is that the state takes these up and runs with them. It too starts to use law as a weapon. It invests in its own stores of human capital, and it asserts sovereignty using the formulas that the church had given it. And the overall pattern here is kind of that of a transfer of resources. States grow up, and they resent the church. Um, for, you know, they basically transfer, there's a resource uh, transfer from the church to the state that allows the states to grow up and to then resent the church. You can think of this as, you know, the state as a teenager and the church as a medieval parent. It's a very familiar um, template. So in conclusion, what I'm arguing in this project is that medieval state formation is, looks very different from early modern. What we see is religious, not secular rivalry. We see also a patterns of emulation where war does not make the state, the church makes the state. And above all, what we see are sacred and deep foundations of secular institutions um, that may in part explain why the European path of institutional development is so unique. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, and uh, we have Jared Rubin from Chapman University here to provide some comments. So thank you uh, for having me, Jeff. Thanks for inviting me, Anna, for this uh, amazing paper slash chapbook chapter. Um, yeah, this is, a, this is a big project. And it's a project that I think is, a, as it was framed, a nice antidote to a large part of the literature, which... Yeah, you know, frankly, and I'll mention this in my comments, when I started as a graduate student, I, I really started reading you know, the, uh, the history on political science and economics on state formation and the path of the modern economy, things like that. It always amazed me how little the church was brought up in, in these accounts, because it's something that it's certainly well known or at least well agreed upon among historians that the church was really important. Uh, and you kind of miss that in the social sciences. And I think that this project is going to take us a long way in thinking about that. Now, what do I mean here? Um, you know, so I'll start by kind of going over how I view this, the big picture of this, this entire, this project, again, not really knowing what the rest of the project looks like. So maybe I might be missing and stuff. But, you know, when we think about the traditional accounts of the rise of the modern state, I do think many of us think of Tilly, um, at least certainly in the European context. 
Um, and this very much is a Bellis' account that, that a number of scholars since, you know, Tilly's kind of landmark book uh, have really latched onto that, you know, the war makes a state, the state makes war. Um, all of this, you know, all of the types of things we think about as being central to the modern state are an outgrowth of conflict in this account, you know, state capacity, taxation, bureaucracy, the types of things that you don't really have if, or if, if you don't have, you don't have a modern state. Um, I think one way that it was very nicely framed in on a chapter here is that this kind of views fragmentation as exogenous or at minimum, you know, other accounts. So like Phil Hoffman's book, you know, in, uh, in 2015, appeal to geographical differences, say between Europe and China, something like that. You have, you know, you have the large, the large plains in China, you have the steppe, and that leads to centralized formation, whereas Europe's a little bit more even fragmented geographically with the Alps and the Pyrenees and the rivers and everything else. And, you know, regardless, most accounts that look at the consequences of fragmentation view fragmentation as exogenous. So for the most part, what this literature looks at is taking fragmentation as exogenous. What are the consequences of this, whether it be within Europe or comparing Europe to most often Asia? Um, I think that one thing that this book, or I, I suppose it's a book, will hopefully do is make us think about, well, A, should we be taking this as exogenous? And if it's endogenous, is the path through which Europe becomes more fragmented than other parts of the world, might that actually play a role in these other long run things that these other accounts are looking at? So, you know, and I think especially when we think about, you know, the process of state formation in general, yeah, I mean, I, I, this is just something, as I mentioned before, I just, when I first started reading this, I couldn't really believe that the church uh, was not really considered a factor in this. And frankly, this is, that was one of the reasons that got me interested in doing this type of research was, you know, to think, think through uh, the mechanisms through which not just, not really religion, but kind of the role that religion plays in, and religious institutions play in political economy, which is precisely what this, uh, this project is about. Now, I do think that this is, uh, again, an incredibly important insight. And I think the general argument is, is correct. I mean, I, I, I think that it's hard to read the history of this period and not, not see the, the way that the church plays different different states off of each other. Um, I do think that, you know, as, as anything, uh, it would, it, these wouldn't be very good comments if I just said, oh, this is great, this is great, this is great, this is correct, <laughs> done. Um, so yeah, I, I think there are places to help fine tune with, with the ma massive caveat that, you know, this is part of, I believe this is part of a book project. So some of this stuff might be in other, other parts, either already written out or, you know, they're part of what, um, would be part of a book project um, because yeah, I think that there are ways to really, you know, strengthen this argument in such a way, you know, when you, when you've, when you've got the basis of a, of a correct argument, it's, it's about strengthening it at that point. And uh, you know, there are, there are certainly people out there, you know, most of them are, are good people. So they're not going to you know, take any personal offense, but whose, whose work would be affected by the, the, this argument in the way that at least we think about their work. So, you know, that said, you know, when you have, when, when you, when you write stuff like that, you gotta, you have to come with a full arsenal. All right. So the first thing that I think could be added, at least again, based to the, the, the paper here, and I'm also, I can send you these slides as well, is, um, is thinking really through the theoretical framework. And I, you know, by this, I don't mean, you know, Greek letters and, you know, game theory and stuff like that. I mean, thinking about the type of conflict, you know, you know, set in a sense, setting up a model, but, you know, in, in words, not, not so much in, in equations of thinking through, you know, who the players are, what they want 
how they interact, how they might interact differently in different circumstances. So one of the things that came through to me, and maybe I'll read this verbatim just because it did not strike me as, as obvious, even though maybe it is if we think about what the underlying framework is, is when um, discussing the, some of the regression results, um, there was a statement in there that, yeah, reverse causality is probably not an issue here. And so the statement is, and sorry if I'm looking off, I'm on a different screen here. The alternative interpretations may be that popes were more likely to enter into conflict with rulers in fragmented areas, but there would be little reason to do so since such rulers did not pose a threat. Conflict was costly and popes strategically and consistently deployed their resources to target the biggest threats. Now, I think on the surface, this makes sense, but I think one thing a framework does is it helps us think through what are inputs and what are outputs. Because some of the stuff we're seeing is just an outcome. It doesn't necessarily mean that even, even if the popes rarely would have been either engaged or you know, per, you know, per mercenaries to engage with smaller states, that doesn't mean that they weren't worried about these states. In fact, my, my, my ex ante and even my reading of the history would suggest that it was the opposite, that a real threat to them would have been had these states, you know, in a sense, ban either banded together, as they often did under the banner of the Holy Roman Emperor, so, you know, to, uh, to, to conflict with the papacy. Um, and I think that this is where a framework can really help us think through what, what you know, what we're getting at. And here's what I, here's what I mean here. So, all right. So I think it's, it's obviously true. Conflict is costly um, uh, in this period. As, as, and, and it actually becomes much more costly uh, a little later in the, as the military revolution ends up. And papal forces, whether that be actually, you know, the, the, small, the small forces of the papal states, but more often than not, you know, the either mercenaries or local alliances. Um, they're, they're, the, the papacy is not competing militarily with the big states. They're not competing with France. They're not competing with England. That in order to compete, they have to use these other mechanisms, whether, you know, often alliances. Um, and I think, you know, one thing that, and I'll get to this in a second, that, that can be added to this framework is the, the papacy or the church more generally has, has a weapon that no one else has. It's the spiritual side. Um, and this is why they're so, they're, you know, they're, they can be so effective. It's not just that we should, you know, we, so this is kind of a, an interesting case, right? Because we're not thinking of the church, we, while we are thinking of them as a, as a political entity in this game, they're a very different political entity than those that they're competing with. So, you know, so what I was thinking here is, and, and this just, and this is my reading in the history, but, you know, I, I think I could be convinced otherwise, because this is the first time we're really kind of putting this down in a model. But, you know, if you look at the map as it's, as it's forming, and I think, you know, Anna's totally right here that, that this is an, an endogenous process, but, you know, we have the, the Holy Roman Empire, which is this amalgam of states, you know, and this kind of bleeds into the Italian uh, peninsula, too, where, you know, south of the Papal States, you generally do have a kingdom of Naples, which um, at various times actually, you know, uh, run by Spain. Um, parts of it are being threatened uh, by uh, Muslim empires. To the north, you have a very fractured, to the north of the Papal States, it's also very fractured, some of which are part of the Holy Roman Empire, some of which are not. Uh, you know, city states. Uh, this is you know the, during the, the the commune period, the uh, really the, the birth of fractionalization in this period. And these city states are, are very wealthy, and they are in constant conflict. Um, so in that case, you know, it's not surprising that the papacy. You know, these are on the pap the papal doorsteps, and frankly, the papacy wouldn't mind incorporating some of this these states into their own territory. It's not surprising at all that the that the papacy wants to keep these states weak. It does not want Venice or Genoa becoming the dominant force in northern Italy. You know, it wants to it it wants you know all of these states to constantly uh, be in a tension with each other, and so this kind of goes back you know to to the statement. It's so for for me at least, it's not obvious that the church would not try to get involved in one way, shape, or form in areas that are fragmented, to keep them fragmented. 
On the other hand, these larger states, so, you know, you can throw in Castile there too, you know, a, a, a number of others, there, uh, maybe not a number, a few others, there's, there's no real mechanism for the church to get involved directly militarily in these states. It can certainly support one side or the other in, uh, in conflict, um, as was noted in the presentation, you know, proxy wars um, w- could be, and, and often were, a mechanism. And in some cases, you know, it was, it was alliances, you know, a little later on than, you know, the period of say uh, that, uh, you know, after 1350, you know, you eventually get alliances against uh, Middle Eastern empires. So especially, especially the Ottoman empire that, that vary um, immensely in who is aligned with in the 16th century, you get the Italian wars, which are obviously on their doorstep, but the alliances are constantly switching in terms of who is fighting with whom. So I would think a framework would think about, you know, when you get, when you're, when you're thinking about how to, how to deal with countries of a certain size, the strategy has to change. You know, it's, it's about alliances there. And frankly, it's about, you know, and, and this is, so uh, there, if, if you look at the history of the Italian wars, this is precisely what happens. So I think, and this is a good, um, kind of a highly consistent with on a story. And I, sorry, I just thought of this. So if I get the history slightly wrong, um, uh, forgive me. Uh, I believe it's Francis the first of France who, who has success in, 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 uh, in Italy is supported by the Pope. But as soon as he wins a war, uh, the Pope switches sides because he now realizes Fran- Francis is getting too powerful, which is precisely what, what Anna is claiming here. You know, you don't want one side, you don't want Napoleon. You don't want one side to become too powerful. You want to constantly be playing these groups off of each other. And frankly, if I, if I were to think about a model, that would probably be the equilibrium strategy is as soon as somebody gets too powerful, you start aligning with other groups. And again, and aligning here, and this is to, to go back to the previous point, is, is two things. One is the way a conventional ruler might do so by either by funds or by people, you know, by, by, by manpower um, in terms of actually helping to fight the war. The other way though is spiritual. And, you know, this is, you know, what a lot of this presentation was about is it's, you know, it's both excommunication. It's, uh, it's about uh, raising bishop bishops in, in, in certain places. It's, it, there, there are, there are a lot of spiritual weapons that can be used that, especially in the earlier period that is central to, uh, this paper are really powerful weapons. Um, all right, so this is where we were before. Okay, so another benefit of the framework was, you know, there was one point where I think, you know, so you mentioned my work briefly, and I, I'm, I'm not going to make this about my own work, but I do think that, that you know, as I was reading it, I think it's actually highly consistent with my own work. So you, you, there's a quote in the paper, it's not that the church failed to legitimate monarchs, it is that the church deliberately sought to balance them against each other. And precluded them from gaining too much authority. I mean, I think that the latter part of that statement after the dash is, is totally right. The question is, why does it have to be one or the other? I think it can be both. Um, and again, you know, the church deliberately seeking balance here is an outcome. We need to think about what are the inputs and how and how can they achieve these inputs. So maybe I'll just kind of go to the end of the slide. I mean, I think that we can think about this and this is where, you know, I think in my own work, this is what I tried to do is think about it comparatively. You might say a religious authority with a high legitimating capacity, you know, like uh, grand muftis in the Ottoman empire or something that like that, or, you know, in the Islamic world more generally, they're often going to benefit from uh, being part of an empire or being part of a large state. And the reason they benefit is that they're part of the ruling coalition. They, they gain the benefits of empire without the real threat of being deposed because part of the reason that empire, the empire kind of sticks together is through the religious legitimacy of, uh, that, that they provide. This is not necessarily the case in, when you have a 
religious establishment with weakening legitimating power. And, you know, frankly, the type of stuff that was, or not the type, the, the very stuff that was mentioned in this presentation was part of this long endogenous process of weakening the legitimating power of the church. The investiture controversy actually ends up doing this. Um, even though it's, it's a power play on the church's part, it ends up being a secular power play that, and eventually rulers, you know, turn elsewhere. Now, a, a, religious, uh, a religious authority with weaker legitimating power wouldn't necessarily want a big empire because the second that ruler, rulers can kind of seek, seek legit, legitimacy from elsewhere, they might do that, especially because the, if, if the religious authority is not that effective at legitimating rule. On the other hand, if you have a highly fragmented area this is where, precisely as is claimed in this chapter, playing off uh, polities against each other can be a really effective means of propping up your own power. Because now, you know, say you have a few a few uh, polities that are in conflict with each other, even if religious legitimacy is not completely central, as long as it has some effect. You can think about it, you know, as you know, like a competitive situation. If if my side has the the legitimacy of the church and the side I'm competing with doesn't, that gives me a, a, an advantage um, in both inter the international politics and domestic. So this is something where I think, you know, when we if we can, if there's a framework for thinking about, you know, inputs outputs both on the spiritual and kind of the secular uh, political economy. It could help us think through some of these these mechanisms for connecting. And I only have a, I, I know I'm probably running a little low on time. I'll just kind of uh, note a couple more things. One is that uh, the framing is I think it's right that when we typically think of, of accounts of the modern state, we think of uh, the Bellasis accounts. Um, I think you know there are some other accounts, and the two I list here aren't exactly about state formation, but they have a lot of implications for state formation. Um, and particularly in the economics literature, there's a lot, there's a gro the growing kind of big think literature does see, does kind of, I think, see the medieval period now more so than it did say 10, 15 years ago as the place where a lot of the roots of them, at least the modern economy into a less, and to some extent, the modern state it's uh, Harold Berman's law, law and Revolution that I think really needs to be grappled with in this. And frankly, I think a lot of it's consistent with what you're saying. Um, you know, but he see he sees as you know as you mentioned in the talk today, uh, the kind of the formation of law, particularly kind of stemming from canon law, uh, as you know as as a medieval thing, and the mo in modern law as as forming from this, uh, it's very it's a very short step. To make the implication that to or to to take what he's saying in the kind of the formation of law to the formation of the state. Um, so again, you know, I, this is just to say that I think there are other accounts out there besides Bellicist ones that do see the formation of the modern, certainly modern economy, and I think to a lesser extent the modern state is earlier. One more thing I think you can do, and then I'll then I'll wrap up, is to show other types of maybe slightly lesser political economy. Um, Type stuff, but what were other attempts that the church did to, to weaken or fractionalize political elites? Because anything that you can add to this that doesn't necessarily directly stem from your framework can, I think, improve the, you know, the, the arsenal that you have to, to really say that this was the case. And I think one thing that you know, it's very, now, now has been picked up by Joe Henrik, but goes back to uh, Jack Goody, is incest regulation that you know this was the idea being that the church imposes really harsh incest regulations up to the sixth cousin, essentially meaning that elites have to you know because they're obviously always intermarrying to some extent in order you know so they they have to seek papal dispensations to marry essentially. This doesn't mean that they can't marry, but it does mean that the church essentially almost gets a veto in who can marry and thus who can make. Uh, different types of political arrangements. Um, you know, Henrik looks at it as uh, ultimately breaking up kinship ties, but all of them are looking at this as, you know, as, as a deliberate action by the church. Now, Goody's idea is that it's mainly a way to make money um, by, by, uh, both, uh, by both the papal dispensations, but also um, by having people with fewer, 
fewer heirs and thus you leave your your land to the church but uh this would also this is also highly consistent with the church wanting some say over you know not really caring about incest or you know whatever what they call incest at anything but the most elite of levels um you know so again just I, and this is just an example i think anything any type of other types of policies that put put forth by the church that would have affected political economy in the way that suggested it's helped the argument. All right. So um, this is kind of uh, just uh, a, a recap. I mean, I think that, yeah, I mean, in, in, in the end, you know, this, to this first point, the, the, the book is certainly a book about state formation. And I think, you know, that's, that's the literature that should be addressed. You know, the, the historical political economy type literature, but you know, it's, it's also should be very much, you know, the, the, there's going to be a lot of different audiences for this, those interested in the political science or economics of religion as well. This is, uh, this, uh, the, this, you know, could, I think could end up being kind of seminal in, in this, uh, in this field. Um, and yeah, I, I really, I can't wait to read the entire book and, um, you know, I'd be happy to look at further drafts as you have them. So, um, yeah, thank you for, thank you for doing this. Yeah, thank you, Jared. Uh, Anna, we have a little time for uh, back and forth. Did you want to res respond to anything that Jared talked about? Sure. So first of all, um, huge thanks for reading so carefully and so generously. Um, so I agree. I think, you know, I do need to impose more structure on the theoretical framework here to basically both clarify what's an input and what it, what's an output, and to sort of make the logic much clearer than it is right now. Um, so thank you for that. I think you know, there's uh, just a few things. I think there are two or three things. One is on um, this idea of you know the of religious legitimation. I think the the key to this is also a mechanism. I mean, there's a mechanism you point out about sort of you know the the, the basically the capacity whether whether a church or a religious authority is weak or strong. But strangely, there's also you know a price um, mechanism here as well, right? So religious legitimation by the church is quite costly. And one of the reasons I think why um, so many rulers want to free themselves from it and so readily sort of, you know, accept these notions of sovereignty and separate, uh, separation of spheres of power is pre precisely because the church exacts such a heavy price, right? You have to you know, uh, follow the church, you have to pay taxes, you have to sort of, you know, do all the things that church demands. And so the, the legitimation is actually quite costly um, in ways that I think, you know, what the, you know, make the rulers want to free themselves from the church. Um, very briefly on Berman and on Greif. I, yes, so you know, this, is the, this is the cop out when you have a book. They're in, they're in a, the book basically has um, chapters on law, administration and parliaments. And clearly Berman plays a powerful, powerful uh, part in the one on law. I think contrary to him, I don't think the story, you know, there's a story that people like Berman and Strayer tell about sort of this wholesale transfer of church influence into the state. And to me, what it actually looks like in practice is much more a question of coevolution, right? So there's sort of mutual borrowing and there's mutual coevolution and some things work and others don't. I mean, there are plenty of things that the church, you know, tries to hand over, like, uh, you know, the electoral principle or rules of chastity that most rulers just refuse to accept, right? So it's not sort of, you know, it's, it's not the sort of wholesale transfer as much as it is a coevolution and sort of negotiation between the two. Um, and then I think finally, you know, yes, I totally agree. You know, the whole, it's not just incest uh, prohibitions, but the whole sort of, you know, apparatus of marriage law, right? Of making children, only some children, making it very hard to have legitimate children, making it very hard to have, uh, to have a marriage in the first place, making dynastic unions more difficult. All of this works exactly as you suggested um, to sort of further fragment authority in uh, medieval Europe. And thank you for bringing this to my, you know, I, mean, I hadn't thought about it in those terms. So this is absolutely fantastic. Um, there'll be a huge footnote thanking you for, for making this, you know, for synthesizing this in such a lovely creative way. Um, because I agree, I think, you know, both the Goody and the Henrik argument are entirely consistent with an account of papal attempts to fragment. And some of these then get rolled back. So when the church is truly powerful at the, you know, fourth lateral council, it rolls back some of these prohibitions, right? So it basically says that, you know, it used to be a prohibition of incest to the seventh degree, which is extremely restrictive, and it rolls it back to four because the church now feels powerful and it feels, you know, it's basically also constantly negotiating with these rulers, right? And wants to gain their support. And in direct response to that, um, it basically relaxes some of these structures. Um, but that's a, I, thank you so much. That's such a lovely creative way of bringing those two literatures together. So I'm very grateful. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have some time for questions. Unless Jared, did you want to say anything in response before we 
Head over to questions. No, those are those are great ones. We'll okay. Get to the questions. Yeah. All right. You may have some time at the back end for more. Um, so Pam McCann uh, is a panelist here, and she she wrote in a question, but I suggested Pam write it or read it and maybe go into more detail if she likes. Sure. Hi, Anna. It's really good to see you. It's been a long time. Um, my Just so everyone knows, Anna and Rob Mickey taught probably one of the hardest classes I took in grad school. It was a qualitative <laughs> methods class. So long, well, not that long ago, right? Just a few years ago. So the months, months ago. Months ago, that's right. Um, so I, I love this incorporation of the church as, in some ways to me, maybe it's because of the way that I see um, bargaining going on, but it seems like it's not just contrary to elite bargaining and wars and all that sort of thing. It's that the church is a part of the elites that are bargaining for power. And so as I was listening to your presentation and then um, Jared kind of picked up on some of it, I, what I was wondering is it seems like the church sees some states as children and you kind of came back, came to that sort of um, metaphor, I guess, at the end too, that, you know, then they grew up and they're teenagers and teenagers are kind of assholes. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, but in addition to that, some of this, it seems like early on though, some of those states were like, were rivals, right? And how, like at what point in time do you become a rival as opposed to one of, you know, someone that you're supporting and here's, here's our bishops and let's develop your, 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 um, your institutions in different ways and kind of buffeting that up. And is it, is it about this sort of uh, competition for power and legitimacy and what they gain from the residents or the population or the resources. Have you thought, I don't know, what, what's your thoughts on that? Right. So I think, you know, the, the two are actually um, happening at the same time. So you have both rivalry and emulation because the church is so organizationally present. Um, so, you know, they, they basically the, the church is everywhere, right? And most kings at this time, you know, around the 11th century, have maybe their personal staff and they are itinerant court, but they have nothing in the way of administration. And so a lot of kings rely on bishops to serve as regional administrators, as judges, as sort of legal experts, as you know, advisors. Um, and as a result of that, what basically happens is that you know, the bishops are in this ideal position to serve as conduits for all kinds of church templates. And what's ironic is that you know, the church is competing with most of these rulers. The church doesn't want any of these rulers to become too powerful. But the bishops are sort of this weird fifth column where on one hand, you know, there are this, the spiritual emissaries. On the other hand, they're part of this elite network. They're all sort of, you know, they're friends and relatives of the rulers and the kings. Um, and they serve to basically import, you know, a lot of this of legal and administrative innovations from the papacy to these courts. Um, so it's not that the church, you know, views, you know, views all these states as either recalcitrant or as friendly. It's constantly sort of worrying about asserting its authority and making sure that it's not encroached upon by secular rulers. I think that, you know, the bigger difference is um, if a state gets too powerful, then the church really goes after, the, after that ruler by building alliances and whatnot. But it views all secular rulers both as, you know, potential allies and as potential enemies. It's just a question of what the ruler does. Um, and I think this might also go away to explaining, you know, some of the, the what Jared was pushing me on earlier, so exemplifying this logic, right? Um, what the church fundamentally wants is autonomy, right? It wants autonomy and it wants authority that it can exercise irrespective of which ruler it's dealing with. Um, it's just that some rulers have much more of a claim to spiritual authority as well as, you know, does the, the Holy Roman Emperor, which is why they're seen as more of a rival in the early period. Okay, I guess I'm next. And um, my question actually follows along pretty well here. Um, it really speaks to the bishops as well, again. And uh, as I was kind of thinking out, thinking about this and just you know thinking out loud while I was, I was typing, I was wondering it's, that it, it seems like the bishops were an interesting position in church state relations uh, in legal and other ways. And you just talked about that right now. Uh, in some sense, you could think of it as a principal agent problem on the part of the church, right? I mean, you had all these bishops out there doing what the church was supposed to be wanting. How much discretion did they have? especially in a, in a world that was, you know, pretty dispersed, uh, maybe hard areas, hard to get to. Um, the church may not have necessarily had, you know, ways to enforce their decisions. Um, uh, and then I thought about it from the bishop's perspective, right? Uh, were there rents to seek on the, on the part of the bishop? Uh, could they shift church power to the state in some way? or in some ways. 
Uh, and then the, just the broad, the broad question again, is there interesting variation if you look at bishop behavior during this time? Okay, so um, I think there's multiple questions. Uh, yeah. questions for the bishop, yeah, no, it's, it's fantastic. So, you know, one of the reasons why the popes engage in this reform program is precisely to assert control over the bishops. Right. So they want to centralize power because they know that they're faced with a principal agent problem. Right. Imagine, you know, a lot of these bishops are the younger brothers of local rulers. Um, they're basically sort of, you know, they're, they're as much part of the state as they are supposedly part of the church. And so what the popes do in the reform program is continually assert authority over the bishops. Um, in order to be named a bishop by the 12th century, you have to travel to Rome itself and receive a special scarf directly from the pope. And unless you do that, and you know, subsequently they mandate even more visits back and forth, um, you, you're not a legitimate bishop. And so the church really, the papacy really tries to exert control over the bishops, fully aware that there might be this uh, principal agent problem. When it comes to rent seeking, it's an odd situation because on the one hand, you know, the bishops, um, especially in places where the church hasn't gained its autonomy, basically are, you know, are, have to pay uh, money to the secular ruler. So they'd much rather keep that for themselves and, you know, pay whatever they have to pay to the Pope who actually extracts a lower, lower tax rate. So as far as the bishops are concerned, they would much rather that the church gain autonomy so that they can benefit more from their position as church uh, princes rather than as secular, in effect, vassals. Right. So they wouldn't, you know, they, they're on the, you know, they're totally into the project of church autonomy. They're not necessarily, they don't necessarily want to support the secular state. But again, because of these personal networks and because of their positions at, uh, at um, state courts, they basically sort of, you know, um, influence both. Um, and finally, you know, when it comes to sort of uh, the role that bishops play locally, there's, you know, there's an interesting story to be told there as well. Um, so there is quite a bit of variation. Basically, the later you become a bishop, the more autonomy you have, right? And so bishops in you know, Norway and Poland and Hungary um, are more autonomous of the papacy than those in Italy and, um, and so, you know, in the surrounding, and so within the papal territories. Um, so the further away you are, the more autonomy from the papacy you have, but the more likely you are to fall under the thumb of the local ruler, right? So bishops in England, Poland, Scandinavia, Hungary continue to be named by kings rather than by, um, but you know, either be named by popes or be elected. They're much more so, you know, suborned by the um, by the state power, um, and this is also, you know, finally, there's a fascinating story here of communes and the local cities, where in some cases the bishops basically totally go along with the commune and want sort of you new know, local city governance, and in fact help to export a lot of their institutions towards that end, and in other places they're totally opposed to um, the founding of the local commune, and unfortunately the data I have isn't fine grained enough to let me sort of you know, figure out why it is that in some places they're opposed to communes and in others they favor them, um, but you know. I feel, a paper, I feel another paper coming on when I think about that. <laughs> but it very much goes to, you know, to the heart of what you're asking, which is about yeah. the, the bishops and their varying roles. So one more tiny question on this, and sure. I probably know the answer based upon your answer now, but my sense is that uh, the church did not necessarily have any real problem um, observing what bishops were doing, right? They probably had people around the bishops that were loyal to them. So the bishops didn't necessarily have much private information or the ability to cut deals outside of prying eyes that the church may have had around? You know, I, I'm not so sure because remember that the bishops are basically part of the same kind of elite networks that govern these countries, right? I mean, so countries, whatever, courts. Um, so, you know, they may have private information regarding what the king is about to do and what other princes are about to do simply because they're part of a social network, an elite social network um, that most people are not privy to. And so I think, you know, that's part of the, the challenge that the papacy faces is to have them come back and to inform and to actually hold sort of, you know, councils in their diocese where priests basically can, you know, utter grievances and mail them to the papacy. And the papacy really encourages basically a network of reporting and appeals of bishop decisions. So if a bishop decides against you, you can appeal to the papacy and the papacy gains more information. So at least inferring from people behavior, they're quite worried about bishops acting on private information and so sort of seeking private rents okay. because of their elite position and their, you know, their relationship to um, the secular rulers of the time. Is that, so one, one more tiny question before we move on. Uh, is that grievance data available? I know John Matsusaka was telling me about that for some other project that he was thinking yeah. about doing. Yeah, so, you know, so in fact, in, in a sort of, in a, in a different project, I'm actually trying to examine some of these. I think, you know, this is, trying to remember who it is, but, you know, there are people who are collecting basically the records of papal appeals 
Because what happens is, you know, the, the, the papacy basically develops this entire court system, and you can appeal decisions made by local ecclesiastical courts by sending those appeals to the papacy and, of course, paying all the fees. And historians have done a lot of work on this, but we keep discovering new troves of these documents. So a lot of these are now being digitized and then scraped. Um, I also have a huge collection of papal decrees, and you can see that the emphases in these decrees change over time, right? So the papacy basically cares about heresy in the 11th century and the 12th century. At the same time, it starts getting really concerned about what kings are doing. Um, and then that sort of you know, drops off because it becomes much more concerned with their local religious communities and protecting them. So I think there's quite a bit of data that's um, coming on um, online, basically, that we'll be able to explore um, pretty soon. Okay. Uh, Andre Falk has a, a question he wrote in here. I'll just, I'll just read it quickly. The presentation is thought provoking. May I know more about how you would trace the causal mechanism by which the church shaped European states? Would it be analytic narrative, uh, consistent with Yuhan Wang's book, uh, historical institutionalist, uh, I saw mention of time and path dependence, or something else? Um, so, you know, I, um, I think of myself as being methodologically relatively eclectic, so I basically grab whatever works, right? And so, <laughs> no, I mean, you know, I think there, there's sort of a lot of data to establish correlations. Um, and then I really, you know, I rely very much on sort of the work of historians to trace how exactly the church influenced the state, right? So you're looking at things like sequencing, you're looking at agents, you're looking at mechanisms, you know, who was present where, um, you know, what followed what. Um, so it is, I think, you know, a combination of um, correlation analysis and analytic narratives. What we don't have is, you know, I mean, I, I very much, you know, I'm not a slave to causal inference, but I very much try to sort of, you know, find instruments for some of these relationships. But the problem is that when you go that far back in time, it becomes an unholy mess, as it were. And so, you know, I don't have a pristine identification strategy um, in this project, um, partly because, you know, the sort of there, there's nothing that is possibly exogenous in this world. Um, and frankly, you know, using rainfall to determine the the influence of the church just seems cheap. <laughs> Okay. There was no there was no major earthquake in Europe at the time. Yeah, you know, there's some earthquakes, but they're also located in Italy and in Sicily. It doesn't really do that much good. Or or volcano eruption or something like that. No. Right. That, now you're talking well, well into the 19th century. So yeah, yeah exactly. So uh, we're going to turn back to Jared for another question. Sure. Yeah. So uh, a few things. One is that. Uh, I did have my history wrong on the, the, the Italian wars. It actually was Francis who lost to Charles of uh, Charles the fifth of the Holy Roman Empire, also of Spain. And then within weeks, the, the papacy switched sides uh, to prevent Charles from getting too powerful. So I thought, again, that was like just a nice little story. It's later than what you. Uh, yeah. Uh, but still, like, I think the, the motivations there. Uh, more general, I was trying to think you know, through this discussion and especially this talk of bishop, bishoprics, you know, is, uh, back to something I was uh, noting in my slides that, you know, you want to think about possible, possibly different strategies that uh, the papacy might take or given uh, who they're dealing with. And another thing on which you would have a good amount of variation is how much land the church owned in the country. Because, I mean, that was one of the reasons why the church was powerful, and especially in some of the bigger countries. You know, it was the, it was the largest landowner everywhere. Um yeah, that varied, though. And also within the Holy Roman Empire, you know, as, as this chapter notes, you know, as you well know that in some place, you know, some of the states of the Holy Roman Empire were run by bishops. Right. You know, so and again, you know, as you were just noting that this is not exactly a one to one relationship. It's not like the bishop was necessarily under the thumb of the pope by any means. But that relationship, you know, is going to be much different. In fact, it might be kind of one of these mediating so I, again, I, I think, you know, th this isn't to say anything specific, but, you know, just thinking through uh, variation in different places. And you know, I just, in the chat, I posted this uh, paper that's a, it's a recent work, it's still a working paper that looks at something somewhat similar to what, you know, you're look, uh, yeah, it has implications rather for what you're looking at, namely what they do in this paper is they look at where the Pope was from, whether the Pope was actually from the Papal States or not, and to try to see whether that led to conflict. In, uh, in with uh, with different states, uh, just something I thought I'd I'd throw out there to you is something you might want to take a look at if you haven't seen it before. But um, yeah, I think more generally the point is that we can think about variation in the church's relationship with these countries. You might be able to really extract some something powerful. 
Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Those are, those are great suggestions. I mean, one of the issues is the data quality. So, you know, I can, it's easy enough to trace which, uh, you know, what country the Pope is from, or even, you know, sort of where um, a bishop is also a prince. The landowning becomes much harder. These are all estimates, right? And so, you know, some of, in, I've, I've been digging through all these sort of historical maps and it's, it's a mess. So a lot of these are estimates. And part of it is that when the church isn't fully autonomous and it owns a piece of land, that piece of land is also owned by the local landlord. Right, and so how do you code that? Right, is it church or is it or is it um, land? Which you know only goes to uh, to show that these these authorities are quite fused prior to the 11th century, um, but it might also present a problem in actually doing any kind of you know solid empirical analysis. But I totally take on point you know this idea of um, these prince bishops who had an explicitly political role and how that may very well differ from the others. I think that's absolutely spot on. And, and I don't know any uh, systematic data, so sorry about that. But, you know, another <laughs> thing, like, you know, so in England, for instance, that you have the House of Lords, mm -hmm. it's, mostly, right. it's mostly uh, cler clergy for, right. until until the Reformation. Um, and, it, and in part because it's, you know, so the, the Lords are in part Lords, you know, there's some Lords that are Lords due to their place in the church, but a lot of it's because they own land. And mm -hmm. that's, that's why they have their place. So. Right. And there's yeah, a fantastic book by uh, Deborah Mukayanis that just came out. That in turn argues that you know all of the landowners in you know, part of the reason why the state was so centralized in England and very very early on is because when William conquers um, England he makes all land ownership conditional right so whether you're a bishop or whether you're a lord you only own the land at the sort of you know the discretion of the king and so he can command the lords to you know to come he can command the lords to dispense justice he can command you know that the parliament meet. Um, in ways that no other ruler in Europe can, because there the land ownership is much more fragmented and it's not, you know, in the hands of the king. Uh, uh, so Anna, it's a uh, really cool talk and I enjoyed reading it. Good discussion, Jared. Um, I was trying to, I've been trying to formulate a question and it's, I've been unsuccessful. So I'm gonna give you a ha sort of a ha half of a question or half of a comment. Um, and obviously you're looking over a big sweep of time and you're looking at a big thing. So there's, you know, you, you kind of have to, you're not gonna have a very tight, tight causal thing, but. But so so two questions. One, one is I th I think the I think the argument, if you boil it down, is something like if the church hadn't have been there, then Europe wouldn't have wouldn't have fragmented. I, I mean I, I know you don't want to put it so stark, but you really do have a sentence. The territory the territorial fragmentation we observe is no accident. It was deliberately instigated by the church. So so there's a notion that that it, I guess I'm trying to formulate in the hypothetical world. There's no church that Europe wouldn't have fragmented. And that seems to me, I, I'm, I'm trying to decide whether I'm uh, instinctively, I, bu I buy that story or, or not. And so I guess I, if that's correct, I'd, I'd be, I, it'd be interesting for me to know, do we have, I know we can't do a counterfactual exercise, but do we have a similar area, similar period where we have, which starts off looking like this, but doesn't have a church that instantly consolidates. So, so that's part one. And I'm going to give you just two disjointed um, questions. Um, but, but, it, but if I take kind of the counterfactual it, or, or the causal claim that's really underlying here, it's that the church really causes this fragmentation. The the other one is that, and again, this is this is really more of a. It's not a really well formed question, but I'm I'm trying to think. There, there's there's reference to the church, and and Jeff talked about the church. He said, well, does the church know what the bishops are doing? Well, the bishops are the church. So, so the church is a whole bunch of people, right? So, so maybe what Jeff means is, does the Pope know what the, what the bishops are doing? But, but what that means to me is that, is that when we, I, I tend to think of, there's kind of two ways to think about, let's say, international politics. One is you have this unitary actor, which is a state that's optimizing itself with respect to everything else. The other one is that it's all driven by internal considerations. The ruler is trying to hold power and it's balancing a whole bunch of other things. And the foreign policy is sort of an, an, in, an incidental consideration. So, um, and those are and, and those are two extremes. But when we think about what the states were doing in this period, clearly part of it is they're trying to, uh, and you gave an example from the Holy Roman Empire, they're trying to stay in power. They're trying to maintain themselves from threats. So obviously the same things are going on with the church, right? The church is, a lot of its actions are trying to maintain power for the center, let's say the Pope, the Pope's in, in, in this case. Um, but the presentation, at least in this talk, and I know it's just the talk, so I, I don't push it too far, but the, the talk is the Pope is sort of this unitary actor and it's not, torn by the same centrifugal forces that are tearing apart all these other states. Um, when of course we see, we, we know it, it, it was as well. And so I'm, I'm trying to think, that, 
it's framing it because it's it's as if the Pope is free from all this stuff and it can decide it can it can dabble in all these other states' affairs without having to worry about its own sort of integrity. Whereas probably it would a lot of its my suspicion is a lot of its actions were driven by maintaining its own integrity as well. And I don't I don't know its history enough to know that, but my just kind of intuition and a few anecdotes is there. So that's a long set of half questions um, and thoughts. So thank you. Those are excellent. Um, so uh, on the first question, you know, had the, would the church basically, you know, what, what is the role of the, the church's role in fragmentation, right? What's the counterfactual here without the church? So what I would argue is that, you know, um, what we see basically is, you know, the Carolingian Empire falls apart in ninth century. It's divided into these three large strips. And that would have probably continued in some way or another, but the church then sort of, you know, starting in the, the early 12th century, deliberately sort of, you know, targets and fragments and engages in conflict designed to elevate the princes and the nobles above the Holy Roman Emperor. Um, so we, we might think of this as two things. One is that this is the church maintaining um, and deepening an already existing fragmentation. And two, that the church is a sufficient but not necessary condition for the fragmentation, right? So there may have been other causes for Europe to be fragmented, you know, including uh, its geography, its, you know, its geopolitics, whatever, but the church, church's behavior was sufficient to maintain that fragmentation. Um, and I think that's, you know, I'm you know, pretty confident that that's where, where things stand. Um, as for the papacy as a unitary actor, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, you know, these days we tend to think of the Pope as, you know, a guy who basically decides whether he or not he wants to stay in power. And usually it's, you know, it's death that kicks these guys out of office and they maintain control over unitary church. That's very much not the case in the Middle Ages where you have popes and anti-popes being elected continually. There are huge schisms in the middle of the 12th century. There's of course the great schism from 1378 to 1417. There's the you know, Avignon papacy um, that's a direct result of the conflict between um, Boniface VIII and Philip IV that I mentioned earlier. So the papacy itself is being continually challenged from within. And one of the things that the popes want to do is, again, to sort of centralize authority as much as possible to prevent that, those kinds of challenges, internal challenges. But they're not successful. They're not uh, remotely successful in doing this up until the 16th century. And so you have this continual contestation for power. So the popes are basically playing a nested game, right? On one hand, they're sort of trying to protect the church from circular incursions. And on the other hand, they're trying to preserve their own um, power position within the church itself. Okay. Uh, we have five minutes left. Anybody have any final questions? Can I, can I just say one sure, more? Sure. Wait, did, did you get any mileage on... Um, I, I don't know, maybe you've gone down this path, but thinking a little bit about the sort of the leadership of the church, their objective functions and how that might have driven some of their policies as well, because the, the, the sort of, again, I agree with Jerry, I mean, that's have a little more of a theoretical framework and maybe that's that's there somewhere else in the project, but but I'm trying to get the objective function of of the leadership of, of, of the church out of this and the the talk and the thing you sent sort of suggests, well, they're just trying to fragment to prevent encroachment by these outside powers. And that's part of it. But if you threw in their own desire to, 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 uh, you know, to mitigate centrifugal forces, would that explain some of the things that are going on? So it, it looks like they're being very deliberative with respect to these external things, but maybe it's driven by internal things. I, I, I don't know. It's a question. Yeah. It's just a question. You know, I think what, what drives um, the papacy's behavior is basically a quest for sovereignty, right? So they want internal monopoly within the church that's unquestioned where they get to rule over the entire church and not have to face anti-popes and schismatics and heretics, et cetera. And on the other hand, so there's internal monopoly over, over power. And on the other hand, there's a freedom from um, intervention, right? That the church can run its own affairs and exercise its spiritual and even political authority as much as it wants without you know, rulers basically um, taking its money, taking its land, naming its personnel and uh, you know, limiting access to human capital. So I think, you know, those are, and to the popes, it's seen as, you know, the reform program of the 11th century is seen, it sees this as, you know, two sides of the same coin. They don't see the two as distinguishable. So they want internal discipline and external um, autonomy. But I, I think you know, what's come across very clearly from both Jared and your comments is that, you know, this really has to be spelled out, right? It's just kind of left in the background with a lot of hand waving at this point. Okay, uh, if there's nothing else, then I will uh, thank Anna for being here and presenting her work. Thank Jared for taking time to provide some discussion. Thanks to all of the attendees and the other panelists, John and Pam, and thanks to Aubrey Hicks and Ann Johnson from the Drosian Center, make my life easy. Uh, and we'll uh, call it a day uh, until the next workshop. Thanks very much to everyone for spending some time with us today. <laughs>
Thank you so much. This was, this was absolutely fantastic. Wonderful comments and great discussion. Thank, Thank you so much. You.